workshop gets recorded for everyone else that's going to be watching this later. Um, yeah, we uh, want to ensure everyone that the change in time doesn't affect anyone's starter plant pickup if you were registered in time before the registration closed for starter plant pickups. But um, everyone, welcome to the workshop this evening. We are talking about tomatoes. I am so excited. This is the workshop that I have been most eagerly awaiting. I know my love of tomatoes uh, runs deep and a homegrown tomato is a really, really special thing. So I'm excited for everyone to be able to bring those uh, lovely, lovely tomatoes, four different tomato varieties that our presenter Dave Long is going to get into um, into their own homes this evening. So without further ado, um, we wanna make sure we remind everyone all of our other workshops that we have hosted. This is the last workshop in this series, the last presentation. We will be having the follow-up question and answer session. As people are starting to get their starter plants in the ground, we imagine there's new inquiries coming up for people. So we wanna create a space to be able to address some of those questions with all the presenters that we've had from the different workshops so far, as well as still try to facilitate a little bit of that community that we all um, really enjoy in the gardening world of being able to come together and share recipes and whatnot and see how everyone's plants are doing. So um, additionally with that in mind, we are hoping to be able to host more of these workshops in the future. A lot of people have already given feedback in workshops that they would like to see. Um, additionally, in the future, in the post-workshop surveys that everyone has been filling out. And if you have additional ideas, we've been getting a lot of interest in um, at-home composting and vermiculture, um, a ton of different ideas, and a lot of interest from master gardeners on giving presentations, both those master gardeners who's, who've already presented to you, as well as additional master gardeners in the area. So if there's anything in particular that you'd like to learn, please, please, please share that information with us. Um, our last go around of our quick Zoom tutorial, I imagine many of you have joined us several weeks now, so I don't wanna kill too much time with this, but just remember our question and answer session that will be happening at the end of Dave's presentation will be um, facilitated through questions input from the chat, which you can access um, either along the top or bottom of your screen, whatever Zoom pops up. Um, I still haven't figured out where to direct you all properly, but in that chat box, um, make sure that you're sending those messages to Anne Graham. I'm gonna be filtering through those questions for the question and answer period. And then when we're in this screen sharing mode like this, if you wanna be able to see just the speaker in your top right corner, you can click um, between these buttons to change your presenting, presenting view. Um, another note for this evening, we have been taking the feedback coming in from those surveys and some of the feedback we've been getting is that the videos and the demos from um, Farmer Charles or I know Melissa did her own planting demonstration for her workshop have been super helpful. Um, we're trying to break up those videos a little bit. We know and we've been getting feedback that those videos are a little choppy and Zoom's just not the best platform for that. Um, but we do understand that that information is really, really essential in understanding how to plant and how to demo and water and things like that. So this evening, we are gonna be trying a little bit new format by showing shorter clips instead of one long clip together throughout Dave's presentation. So bear with us as we try that out. We wanna see how you all receive that. And if there's um, positive feedback, if we do future workshops, we wanna be able to present the best model for you all. But um, we're gonna move on to our presenter this evening. Our lovely Dave Long um, is gonna be talking to us about tomatoes. He asked me to cut his bio by a lot. So his main points he wanted me to share with you is that he's lived in the Tahoe Basin for 18 years. He currently resides in South Lake Tahoe. Um, he's an avid fly fisherman and really loves that in addition to gardening. And he loves a good glass of wine. So without further ado, Dave, I'm gonna turn it over to you so you can get going. Okay, let's see what we have going here. Um, let me know if I, the presentation shows up. Somehow it hasn't shown up yet. Okay. There it goes. Is that it? I don't. I see you, but I don't see the presentation. I see your Zoom launch screen, and now your email. <laughs> Well, let's try it again, see if we can get up and figure out how to do this. Sorry, guys, I thought I had it all 
Do you have the can you, PowerPoint? Can you, see can, can you see that? Yes, I can. Okay. Perfect. Take okay, it away. okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry for the confusion there. Um, the workshop is on tomatoes um, and kind of repeating myself a little bit from last week and the other presenters previous weeks. Um, we have an informal group that has come together to work on this kind of a project and it includes uh, Slow Foods Lake Tahoe out of the Truckee area, UC Davis, uh, Turk, um, Tahoe Environmental Research Center, and Allison. They're the ones who are putting the technical parts of this together. The Desert Farming Initiative out of the University of uh, Nevada, Reno. They're the ones who grew our tomatoes for us, and they also grew the lettuce and kale um, for us as well. So we're very happy to have them on board. And uh, Charles Chambray, you'll see during the um, presentation tonight. And then, of course, uh, the UC Davis uh, Master Gardeners, uh, the Lake Tahoe Master Gardeners, has participated in that. Melissa. Guthrie, our potato lady, was there. And tonight I'm representing the Tahoe Heritage Foundation, which um, maintains the historic estates on the south shore of Lake Tahoe, the Pope House, the Baldwin House, and then the Valhalla Group uh, maintains the uh, Heller Estate there on South Lake Tahoe, near Camp Richardson. Okay, we came together uh, informally and we kind of refer to ourselves as the uh, the garden group or the demonstration garden group or dig. We do represent four demonstration gardens in the Lake Tahoe area. And we are very interested in finding out if there are more public gardens or demonstration gardens or community gardens that would either like to participate in this type of a program or uh, if they would like some help from one of our participants, one or more of our participating uh, organizations. So if you know any gardens that need to get going, school gardens or community gardens or demonstration gardens, let us know if they need some help or would like to participate. So tonight we're talking about tomatoes and, and it really is the problem child of Lake Tahoe. Everybody wants to grow them, but we have a lot of um, issues. One is you go to the stores and you buy the plants, but then it snows. Um, your plants are growing well, you're getting some ripe tomatoes and suddenly you see chipmunks, squirrels, raccoons, bears in your backyard eating your produce. And then just as the tomatoes start, and start to ripen at the end of the season, we get our first snow of the season or the first hard freeze of the season and your tomato plants and fruit are kaput. The topics we're going to be covering tonight are, are phenology, uh, that's the study of plants as they, they relate to weather and climate, taxonomy, anatomy, plant care, uh, and planting, which Charles is going to help me on, uh, some history and culinary aspects and varieties uh, that we're providing, and then our supplier information. And then this Saturday, we're um, distributing our, our tomato plants. I think somebody could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we have over 500 plants that we're trying to distribute to our participants. So we have 500 tomato plants looking for a home. Hope you come out on uh, Saturday and pick them up if you've signed up. Um, phenology is the, the science of studying growth and development of plants as weather affects their growth, uh, weather and climate. And specifically for our purposes, we're comparing different varieties of tomatoes in this case to see which ones uh, respond best in our Tahoe climate, which is a short uh, season climate with cool uh, evenings, um, short growing season, and uh, a lot of intense sunlight if you can get through the trees. So why are we doing tomatoes this time around? Well, tomatoes are probably the most commonly grown vegetable in the United States. It is the wise, most widely canned or bottled, at least commercially, vegetable in the world. 
it's a challenge to grow in the Tahoe Truckee area. I mean, it really is a challenge. Maybe next to artichokes is going to be a real challenge. It's kind of an interesting vegetable because uh, even though legally it is a vegetable, botanically it is a fruit. Um, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court in 1893 to, to uh, have it declared a vegetable for the purposes of commerce. The, the um, tomato was also the first genetically modified food licensed for human consumption in the United States. And this was the Cal Jeans flavor saver from a tomato that was first sold in 1994, but because of the public's uh, perception of a genetically modified food, it, it was eventually discontinued in uh, 1997. Um, California leads the nation in the produ production of fresh, uh, or of total um, tomato production, and we're neck and neck with uh, Florida in and fresh fruit production, tomato production. However, um, we're, we are dwarfed by the amount uh, of uh, tomatoes that China produces, and India actually produces more than the United States as well. In terms of uh, consumption, surprisingly to me, the Egypt, Tunisia, and Turkey have the highest per capita consumption of tomatoes in the world. And it's not surprising that uh, Italy exports more of the uh, processed tomatoes than any country in the world. So a little interesting things, um, eating tomatoes was, were featured in an episode of You Were There on radio and television. I'll talk about that a little more when we get to Thomas Jefferson. Um, the longest tomato vine uh, was 65 feet in length. And the biggest uh, tomato ever grown, recorded as to being grown, was over seven pounds, almost uh, over seven and a half pounds. And for a single plant, the record production, tomato production, is 342 pounds of tomatoes on a single plant. A kind of a, a monster plant, apparently. Uh, and then he the Heinz Company uh, introduced colored ketchup for a few years called Easy Squirt and the colors were blue, green, and purple. And, and that, that idea went uh, belly up by 2003, and all of them were, were discontinued. Although I've heard rumors that it's coming back. Uh, the tomatoes are in the Solanaceae family, which includes potatoes, nightshades, the belladonna plant, or the poisonous belladonna plant, and eggplant, peppers as well. Um, Tomatoes are very closely related to um, potatoes. In fact, you can graft a tomato plant onto a um, potato plant so that you can, if you do it right, you would get potatoes underneath and tomatoes up. If you don't do it right, you don't get anything, but you can graft them. They're very, very closely uh, related. Um, it's native to South America, um, as was the potato. Interestingly, uh, though, it was not used extensively by the native uh, South American tribes or indigenous people, nor was it used extensively as a food in um, uh, Central America. But by the time it, it was traded up to um, the Mayans and the Aztecs, it became a, a, a central part of their uh, culture and cuisine. Um, the, the typical Tomato plant, very, very similar to many flower plants, any, any kind of plant, a root system, not an extensively deep root system, but it does have a, a root. And there are a stem. The stem will have what they call uh, suckers that are secondary stems that will come up. We'll talk about that. It has leaves, it has a perfect flower, and it has um, uh, flowers, buds, fruit. Typical vegetable. The, the Solanum uh, genus was first described by Pliny the Elder, and it gave the name Solanum, um, which either means uh, in need of sun, which tomatoes definitely do, or a uh, soothing effect, which, which might have referred to um, the belladonna plant. 
um, in its use for um, its uses. And then Linnaeus are, um, gave the species name based on samples that he received from Spain. Um, and he um, gave it a Lycopersicum, which is Latin for uh, wolf peach. Um, apparently the first um, varieties of tomatoes into um, Europe were uh, yellow tomatoes that had a slight fuzz on them. Um, and also that it was thought to be a poisonous plant because of relationship to belladonna. And, and anyway, you got the name wolf peach. Except in, I should say, except in um, England, where for some weird reason it was called the love apple. And then in Italy, it was pomodoro, which is the golden apple. And anyway, uh, you can define uh, tomatoes based on its color or the type of growth or the size and shape. So you have red, pink, and orange, purple striped tomatoes, which define a type of tomato. Or you can have tomatoes based on size. The smallest tomatoes I'll call uh, current tomatoes, and they're very small. I mean, they're smaller than a grape. Uh, then you have a grape-sized tomato, a cherry tomato, plum tomatoes, the standard tomato is kind of the one that's used for slicing. The beef steak is, for all intents and purposes, a large standard um, tomato that is used for slicing. And then the ox heart, which is the unusually shaped uh, tomatoes, often referred to as heirloom uh, tomatoes. Um, but for, for our discussion tonight, the important uh, part of it is the tomato based on plant growth. And there are two types, uh, three types of plant growth. One is a determinate plant growth. And a determinate plant is one where it grows much more bushy. It will set fruit within a very short period of time, and then that's it. So if you are a, a commercial grower, all your fruit and all your flowers flower at the same time. All the pollination takes place at the same time. All the fruit ripens at the same time. So you can have your labor force come in, pick the uh, fruit that is ripe, and then send it to market. If you are a home grower, a determinate plant, it might be important to have if you're into make canning fruit or canning tomatoes or making tomato sauce, you want all your fruit all your tomatoes to ripen at the same time so you can harvest them and then can them um, and you're done with it for the season. An indeterminate plant, uh, many heirlooms are indeterminate plants. They continue to grow until either lack of water or frost kills it. And an indeterminate plant will produce flowers and fruit, not in huge uh, amounts, but consistently throughout the season. So an indeterminate plant for a slicing potato or a potato that you would have for your salad, this is a great plant to have because you'll have fruit throughout the season. And then, of course, there's always the, the intermediate one, which is very rare. And what this one does is semi-determinate. It will set a series of fruit early in the season and then pretty much nothing until late in the season. Then it will have a second blush of flowers and fruit. Uh, and there we go. We just explained what that was. <laughs> that move. <laughs> when we're growing tomatoes in Lake Tahoe, the thing that we have to really be conscious of is sunlight, 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 and warmth, warmth, warmth. So what you're trying to do in this cool evening, uh, short season, is provide the tomato plant with as much light as possible and as much heat as possible, both for the plant and the soil. So one of the things you want to look for is planting your tomato plants on a south or west facing uh, fence line or building face so that the heat of the day uh, is absorbed by the plant and the building or fence and then re-radiated out during the day. This, this allows the plant to stay warmer. It helps uh, a whole lot in, in getting the plant to develop and then set fruit. 
many of the tomato varieties that you get in the big box stores or at nurseries not only need a longer season, but will not set fruit if the temperatures drop below certain degrees. The ones that we have selected will set fruit down to about 50 degrees at night. If it drops much more below that, the, the plant will have trouble setting fruit. And some of the, the more popular varieties that you do find in the store or in seed catalogs, they, they need evening temperatures above 60 or 65 degrees to set fruit consistently. So another way thing to do it, the middle picture there, it shows uh, another example of planting it next to a building and the third uh, to the far right is the same thing using containers against the building so that the heat is radiated back out during the day or during the evening. For, for Lake Tahoe, we're in great shape as far as pH uh, of the soil goes. Uh, tomatoes like very slightly acidic soils, which is I, exactly what our native soils are here in the Tahoe Truckee area, except for maybe some lake soils that might have a slightly um, higher pH in certain cases, or more bog-like, if they're water um, saturated, maybe more bog-like, maybe slightly more acidic. But, but it's within the range. Um, you should prepare the planting area by mixing in about uh, two pounds of a 10-10 fertilizer per 100 square feet. If you have um, um, higher uh, away from the lake, so it's uh, less organic matter in your soil, uh, decomposed granite or granitic soil with a lot of big rocks, you want to add some organic material in it to, or um, um, well-aged compost to improve the moisture holding capacity of, of the soil. If you're planting in raised beds, you might want to consider adding some silica sand or perlite to your potting soil mix to loosen up the soil and to allow uh, better percolation. What we've found consistently oh, in potting soils that you buy in the large bags is that there's very little uh, sand or um, perlite in it. Um, and so it compacts when it's used ex exclusively in a raised bed or a container. So loosen up the soil. Uh, it will help your water percolation and aerate your soil a little easier when you do it. And now I think I'm going to turn it over to Ann to get, so Charles can talk a little more about planting our tomatoes. Hi, I'm Charles Shembri, the program manager of the Desert Farming Initiative, and we're here today at our, uh, we call it our home site, where we have um, some smaller garden scale uh, farming we do in our hoop houses. And today we're going to go over some planting of uh, tomatoes. So there's two types of tomatoes. There's indeterminate and determinate varieties. So that's something you really want to know. Today we have a Cherokee purple. Cherokee purple is a really nice heirloom and um, it's an indeterminate variety. And you might get your tomato like this in the garden center or from slow food. So it should look something like this. Never have to worry if a tomato is getting too leggy because we want to plant them as deep as we can get them. So I'm going to talk about that. While you're planting your tomato, don't worry about suckers. We just want to worry about getting it planted as deep as we can. There's quite a few different methods to planting a tomato. Rule of thumb is we want to be able to plant at least past the first like, you know, two to three sets of leaves. So even if you could get it down to about right there, that's going to be good. Some tomatoes are hairier than others, but all of these hairs on, on the tomato plant um, will turn into roots when they are making contact with the soil. So that's why we want to get them as deep as we can. Tomato is like a vine. And when you go to plant this tomato, definitely, absolutely take off. This is the first set of uh, flowers, which are going to become fruit. Take those off. We want our plant to be in a vegetative state of growing. We don't want it to start producing fruit. It's going to focus itself on fruit production as soon as it starts producing the fruit, especially a determinate variety. Indeterminates are going to continue to do this, so it's not, it's not the end of the world if you don't pull this off. But when I plant this plant, I want it to focus on its vegetative growth, and it's going to put flowers back on before you know it. 
it really doesn't matter. There's no evidence, but I know a lot of gardeners, they like to cut off some of the lower leaves, okay? And there's also suckers that are starting to come up and those are gonna become a branch. So I'm gonna plant this deep and I don't want those to keep coming up. I'm gonna go ahead and say, I'm gonna plant mine at least that deep. And you, you could even go deeper if you like. You could go as deep as this. Why don't we just do that for the sake of it? So that right there could scare some people. You don't have to go that deep if you're too scared about it. Go, go right there or do two. Do one real deep, do one not so deep. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plant this down to about here. We're going to space our tomatoes about every two feet, depending on the tomato variety. It also depends on how you're going to trellis your tomatoes. So I'm going to dig deep. I'm going to break up the soil in there. This is a good time to throw fertilizer. If you have an all round fertilizer, as long as it's not too much, you don't want to throw in a lot of back guano and burn the roots. But I'm going to go ahead and break these roots up a little bit. And I'm going to try to get this as deep as I can. Let's see what I end up with here. And I'm going to fill it back in. Another method to maximize your growth of roots off of the stem is to plant it horizontally and bend it up like this. Okay, that's a technique that people really like to do. And I've actually read some papers from people in colder climates that that is really beneficial. I don't have to go too deep. I'm just going to make a hole that got enough width here to do this technique. I'm going to break this up a little bit and I'm going to plop that in about six inches deep or so. I'm gonna fill this in. We're gonna let these grow for a few weeks before we start suckering them. A very good general approach to tomatoes is to select three central leaders. If you don't reduce the flowering and fruit locations, your fruit's just gonna be somewhat small smaller than you want it to be. So pruning is essential. If you want to get a big tomato, you've got to learn how to prune your, your, your tomato. One of the things that Charles mentioned was planting it uh, horizontally so that you could see the um, uh, roots developing from the hairs of the stem. And um, the nice thing about doing that at high elevation or cool season is that the soil will be much warmer at the surface than it will be uh, further down. Um, when he plants it very deep, like he showed that first example, we would recommend that you dig your hole a day or two ahead of time so that that soil hole, that hole that you're placing in it, is very warm. And then you fill it in so that the plant is not shocked. Uh, by having the uh, um, cold soil uh, impact the root development. One of the other things that we recommend uh, to consider is planting it, planting your tomato plant through a fenestrated plastic cover. The clear works well, red is sold commonly for tomatoes. W what you do is you place the clear plastic with holes, small holes in it, uh, down and you plant through that and what happens is that the plastic acts like a mini greenhouse at the soil level so the sunlight uh, goes through the plastic and then is captured much like a greenhouse and the soil remains much warmer doing it that way. Um, the other thing that you can do is especially if you're growing in uh, raised beds or containers is to use a dark colored container black terracotta, uh, what that does is absorbs the uh, sunlight, warms the container, warms the soil in the container, uh, and that works very well when you're trying to get as much heat and warmth to the plant as possible. One of the other things to consider is they have what they call a water wall, and that is um, um, a, a container of water, typically it's either green or red plastic that you put, put around the plant. Again, the sunlight hits it, warms it up, uh, and then that heat is radiated back during the evening. 
You can use one of these uh, uh, camp showers and just lay it next to the plant. You can use a jug of clear jug of water, chain, um, put some food coloring in it to make it blue or green so it absorbs the heat better. Put that next to your plant. Or you can plant, uh, uh, put a large rock or something that has a thermal mass next to your plant so that you can have um, some um, re heat retention during the day, re-radiated out during the evening. And then watering is an important part of it. And I think Charles is going to do a short video on that. And then hopefully I'll get squared away coming back um, when we come back. Tomatoes are one of the coolest plants in the world because they don't need a lot of water. I mean, their root system grows really fast. On a drip system, what we do is we plant our tomatoes and we give them like at least two to three hours of water. Out in the field where we have a deeper soil profile than our hoop houses, we give them up to four or five hours, which is going to be equal to at least a couple gallons of water per plant. And we can do that about once a week. We don't want to water them a lot every day. You, know, you can make a little water well. I mean, that's definitely a nice, cool thing to do. Um, you know, make a little depression around here. We just buried this pretty deep, so it works nicely with tomatoes. And then, you know, if we just make this little well, I know everybody's probably done this before, and you're maybe wondering, is that a okay thing to do? Sure it is. Come over here with your soaker hose and fill that up. Let it pool up and let it soak down in. And I'll, when I'm in my garden by hose, I'm gonna fill that up. I'm gonna fill this one up and I'll walk around and then I come back to this again. I want to give this as much deep water as I can. And then before you know it, up in the Tahoe on the lake, I mean, you might, people can dry farm tomatoes in a lot of the cool climates in coastal California. You could probably do that. You know, maybe you could do that in some of your garden soil. And um, when they're mature though, once a week, you can water your tomatoes once a week, nice deep watering, maybe once every four days. Um, if it's very hot, and, you know, use your judgment. Uh, tomatoes, once they're once they're established, does do not require a heck of a lot of water. Um, and uh, if you, uh, one of the things that Charles did not talk about was the consistency of watering. So what you don't want to do is some days uh, really saturate the plant, and other days let it dry out so it almost wilts. What that will do is that the fruit will start to set a certain size. And once that size is set, then it will ripen. So your, your fruit will get to a certain size and then it will complete ripening. If it has a huge amount of fluctuation in watering, it will cause the fruit to split. And those of you who have grown tomatoes before and have had their fruit split, invariably that's due to uh, after the fruit has sized up, uh, a lot more water has been received. The plant uh, takes up that water and bursts the uh, uh, tomato plant. So anyway, just another aspect. Okay, okay so <clears throat> one of the other things we're trying to do to keep our plants warm is covering them. So when it gets cold or cool, a couple things you can do. You can use a frost blanket which is just a, a cloth, that a lightweight cloth that you put over the plants. In the evening, they, they rather than um, uh, photosynthesize, they transpire. They give up a little bit of heat, and this uh, frost blanket will lock that heat in and, and the, keep them warm. Uh, another thing you can do, it, oh, if you do use a frost blanket, make sure you anchor it down well. Otherwise, it will be blowing over the neighborhood. Another thing you can do is called a, a row cover. The row cover that you see there at the bottom is a white covering, so it's like a frost blanket, but this particular one has a, a water bag that goes along with it to hold the, the a frost blanket in place. That water is another uh, heat reservoir that radiates heat. And one of the most effective methods for the local um, grower in the Tahoe Truckee area is to find a large clear plastic bag, a large clear trash bag. They're available online in stores. Uh, rather than having a black one or a gray one, you can find a clear one. 
And this is great to put over your, your trellising system or your cage to keep them warm. You can go online and buy them that have little slots on in them so that you can reach in and, and harvest your, your uh, tomato as well. Um, I've mentioned trellising. Uh, tomatoes need to be supported so that the fruit is off the ground. If the fruit is in contact with the gr ground, it will get what they call bottom rot. That's where the fruit looks great on top, but if you pick it up, the bottom has started to rot, turn brown. You can do uh, homemade uh, trellises, uh, TP type things out of sticks and branches. Uh, you can go online and actually buy this type of bamboo trellis. You, depending on where you plant it, if it's next to a fence, you can uh, tie, the, tie the plant up to the fence. You can always go to uh, one of the stores and buy a the, the traditional tomato cage, which works well, uh, or you can go to specialized be, um, distributors or sales places that have uh, fencing that are designed to be used as a trellis for tomatoes or, or special high-end um, uh, step ladder type of uh, trellis systems. So keeping your plant off the ground is, is important uh, to get good air circulation so the fruit does not rot. And I think we're gonna see another one of Charles actually doing some trimming of a indeterminate variety. Suckering happens with indeterminates. You can prune your determinates a little bit, but generally, you know, some people don't, it's, it's okay. But indeterminates, no matter what, you wanna be pruning or suckering. Suckering is really the, the method of pruning. So if we look at this tomato here, you can see we have these main, these leaf branches, you could call it. You see this uh, little shoot that's growing. There's one here, there's one there, there's one here. And you can even see here's a bigger one, okay? And this would be the original right here. This is gonna be the original shoot coming off. So the more suckers you have, the more fruit you're gonna have. So we wanna get rid of some of those suckers because we wanna reduce our fruit load. We usually don't want anything down low. It's good to have got a lot of airflow in your plant underneath. So we're gonna just pinch these off. Okay, you can see right here, I'm gonna pinch that off. And I also, at this point, I wanna remove these leaves because I want some airflow underneath my plant. I don't want my leaves making too much contact with the soil. And let's see what I got left. I got one, two, three, and really four. Actually, I got, I got one, two, three, four. You know, as you get further into pruning, you can understand the spacing you want. I'm gonna take that one off. Some people will leave the top three. So I've got one, two, and I could leave three or four. I'm gonna leave that one. So I'm gonna take this one off. So now these, three, one, two, three are gonna become my central leaders. And that's suckering right there. And it's a good practice to sucker throughout the season to reduce the density of your plant. Okay, so what Charles is talking about in suckering uh, is, is typically pruning for um, tomatoes. It's called suckering. For your indeterminate varieties, you will have a lot of these secondary stems that come off that you need to pinch off because it will start producing flowers and fruit. And if you have too great a fruit load of, for your plant size, the fruits, one, won't size up properly. And unless they size up, they won't ripen properly. So a lot of people will say, geez, I got a lot of fruit, but none of them ripen. And one of the reasons that happens is that you have too many, um, too many small tomatoes for the size of plant and until those tomatoes actually size up they won't fully ripen so keep that in mind now end of the season stuff towards the end of the season uh we'll start getting cooler and cooler weather as the fruit won't uh ripen as quickly and one of the things you can do is pick the fruit put it in a paper bag and ripen it inside Put it with an apple or a banana, whatever. Um, you can do that, 
what we would recommend is that you take the whole brack or branch that contains all the fruit. In this picture, you can see the individual removing individual uh, tomatoes, and he's going to ripen them in a bag. What we would recommend is that you take that whole branch off and ripen it in the bag. The reason is, as soon as you cut that branch off, that the brack of uh, tomatoes, uh, the plant, the, the part that you've cut off, uh, has uh, hormone-like um, uh, compounds that is transmitted to the fruit, basically saying, hey, look, I'm dying. I've just been cut off. I've been severed. And unless these seeds ripen, uh, we will not be able to carry our genome to the next uh, generation. So that sends a message to the fruit to ripen up. And then uh, a, a gentleman named Gary Romano, who wrote a book called July and Winter, Growing in the Truckee Area. He's a commercial farmer in the area. Uh, he recommended at the end of the year to dig up the whole plant, cut off the roots, and then put it on a table or hang it up in the garage, uh, and the fruit will ripen uh, very consistently and very uh, quickly in doing that because uh, all the hormones from the plant are going to the fruit uh, saying, hey, you guys got the, the fruit has to ripen. And then we also recommend that after you harvest, uh, that you dispose of all your plant uh, materials, all the roots, stems, leaves. In the case of tomatoes, and even more so for potatoes, um, but uh, peppers and eggplants, uh, they are very susceptible to getting a virus load in their um, plant parts. And the viruses will, will increase in the soil, uh, especially if you leave the uh, leaves, stems, or roots to decompose in the soil. So we recommend um, that you go ahead and um, remove and dispose of all your, your plant, plant parts. And we also recommend that you rotate your plants uh, if, you're use, if you're planting um, the Solanaceae family. We want you to rotate your plants, your, your crops, um, so that you don't plant more than two years in the same place. Tomatoes, potatoes, those types of plants. Uh, okay, let's see. Pests. These are uh, something everybody wants to know. Uh, aphids uh, will affect the plant uh, unless it's truly horribly infested. Then uh, you don't see an effect on the fruit. Um, uh, the, the aphids do not attack the fruit. Uh, cutworms, flea beetles, and then the ever the hornworm, which is a, a hawk moth. That's the big green. Uh, tomato uh, caterpillar that you see oftentimes. Um, the best way to control the aphid, oh, the other thing that I don't have on here is white flies. In the Tahoe Truckee area, every couple years we have an infestation of white flies. Uh, most years though, it's, it's not so bad. But aphids, the cutworms, flea beetles, and the white flies can be uh, treated um, fairly easily with a soap solution that we've talked about in just about every one of these workshops. That'd be a, a slope solution. You can add a garlic or a hot pepper into that uh, to, to spray on the uh, plants for aphid control. Uh, uh, tomatoes are kind of uh, leggy and kind of weak, so if you use a high pressure hose on it, you can actually damage the, the plant or knock over the plant. So a high pressure hose may not be the best way to control aphids. For the uh, hornworms, the easiest thing is to to have the kids or, or you pull it off and then take a bet and you squeeze it which end it pops. Uh, always a fun thing to do in the garden. Uh, the other thing you can do for the uh, hornworm is you can use this Bacillus turgensis, ter uh, which uh, uh, stops the development of the caterpillar from caterpillar to uh, the moth stage. The downside of using this biological control method is that it affects all types of butterflies and all types of uh, moths. 
So it, it does have an impact if you are looking at having a, a biologically friendly or butterfly butterfly friendly garden using this will actually um, uh, inhibit the development of the larval stages of the uh, Leptopteros. Oh, and then you have mice, squirrels, uh, and that kind of stuff. The best way is uh, exclusion systems. If you have a problem, uh, fencing, netting, that kind of thing um, are, are the best ways to keep the mice, squirrels uh, out of it. Um, Okay, let's see what else we got here. Uh, oh, going the wrong way. Okay, so real quickly on the uh, history of the tomatoes, I hope you guys mind. Uh, we mentioned uh, how the Mexico uh, was where the Aztecs and Mayans used it as a central part of their food system. The Spanish overtook the uh, Mayans and the Aztecs, and they um, accepted the tomato, brought it to the Europe, and uh, started using it as their food. Uh, first reports in Europe were around 1544. Uh, first tomatoes were probably yellow. Um, by um, within a decade, it was had moved to um, Italy. Um, let's see, Cosmo, Cosimo Medici was one of the first Italians to grow the um, tomato on his uh, estates. Um, the tomato was not well received throughout Europe, except in those areas where uh, Spain controlled either the economy or it was a province of Spain. And in, in the 1500s, um, Spain controlled the southern half, half of uh, Italy and Sicily. So the uh, introduction of um, the tomatoes in that part of the region uh, happened very early. Um, but by the 1800s, uh, tomatoes were an important part of salads and even desserts uh, in many parts of, of uh, Europe. Okay, in, in the United States, um, because our, our relationship with Europe was England and Northern Europe, um, tomatoes were grown as a um, specimen plant and were not usually eaten. They were thought to be poisonous. Um, the You Were There episode was Thomas Jefferson going to his summer residence um, and then through Lynchburg, um, he saw a garden full of tomatoes and to the chagrin of uh, the populace, he got off his horse, ate it. They thought they, he was gonna pass out and die but uh, he was familiar with the tomato and its value um, based on his time in, in Europe. In the You Were There segment, where I'm not sure if anyone, hosted by Walter Cronkite, no less, it, it was a period piece and they, they had actors representing these people. And then all of a sudden, uh, out of nowhere, a 20th century reporter with a microphone would come up and talk to people about what was going on. It, it was kind of an interesting program radio and TV. Anyway, in the United States, uh, the tomato gained acceptance in the areas that had proximity to the Spanish colonies. So that would be um, New Mexico, Texas, uh, especially Louisiana uh, and Florida. And um, that's where the tomato in the United States became uh, common um, in the cuisine. Okay, so, gosh, uh, tomatoes did not become real popular in the United States right away, but um, tomato pills, for some reason, took off. It had some health benefit um, with a product called tomatine that was supposed to have the ability to cure uh, intestinal problems and diarrhea. Uh, in uh, the United States at the time, the sanitation was not the best. Uh, the rivers and water systems were not uh, what we would consider uh, sanitary. So a lot of people had um, intestinal problems, diarrhea and that kind of stuff. And this tomatine pills was supposed to solve that. Uh, in 1839, 30% of the whole newspaper in Hartford, Connecticut 
was nothing but tomato pill advertisements. After this uh, big tomato pill fad faded, people started realizing, well, maybe there is some health benefits from eating to tomatoes. And at that point, tomatoes started to get uh, popular. And fresh tomatoes in the, were in demand, and that demand led to an inventiveness that the United States was famous for at the time. So the tomato surplus led to a couple opportunities. Okay, <clears throat> the demand for tomatoes blossomed. Uh, they, just like today, the first people to the market with the first tomatoes got the best value. By the end of the season, the glut of tomatoes on the market, you could, couldn't even sell them. You, you couldn't even give them away. There were so, so many of them. So farmers in um, New England and New York started buying land in Maryland and Virginia and using that newfangled thing called the railroad to ship the tomatoes north to the major cities. And then in the West or the Midwest, uh, what was happening in Arkansas, Missouri, and uh, Alabama, the tomatoes were ripening there sooner and they were using that newfangled steamship to go up the Mississippi to northern towns like uh, Chicago, uh, Minneapolis, Cincinnati, and Pittsburgh. And they were, that's how they got it the tomatoes there first to get the best pricing. New England farmers being uh, inventive came up with a different way of growing them and they started growing them in hot houses and cold frames and then a modification of the cold frame called the hotbed which was just a deep cold frame uh, with the bottom five or six feet of the cold frame uh, filled in with fresh manure so that as the manure decomposed, um, it created heat that heated the cold frame that allowed the tomatoes to ripen even in the middle of winter. Uh, however, um, this, this type of growing system in the 1850s, that word hotbed was um, commandeered by um, anti-slave groups. So when you were talking about secessionism, it was a hotbed of secessionism, a hotbed of outlawed, outlawing. And so this hotbed had the connotation it was something bad, but at the very base of it was full of manure and, and, and kind of an interesting word. Anyway, um, one of the other things they started doing was looking at varieties that would ripen early. So um, that was another thing that was going on. But this glut, glut of tomatoes gave an opportunity for the new fangled industry of canning foods to take that glut of tomatoes and do something with it. The tomatoes are tough to can uh, and bottle. The canning, because it's slightly acidic fruit, and the early cans used lead solder to hold them together. So the acidic properties of the tomato leached the lead out and caused um, poisonings, but uh, that was eventually solved by coating the can or using non-leaded non um, um, solder. Okay, now the next one. Uh, tomato bottling began. Uh, Campbell, uh, famous Joseph Campbell, started as uh, providing rations during the Civil War. After that, he started a company uh, to bottle different and preserve different kinds of fruits and vegetables, uh, spotlighting the use of the abundance of uh, tomatoes late in the season. Um, very successful. He started out as a Campbell's Preserve Company in 1897. The condensed tomato soup was introduced. Uh, by 1922, it changed its name to uh, Campbell's Soup Company. And then the famous uh, jingle uh, about Campbell's soup was introduced in uh, 1931. You, you guys are getting tired of this. You can. <laughs> okay, ketchup. Everybody loves ketchup. Ketchup is a condiment. Uh, what's a condiment? A condiment is an additive to uh, cooked food or finished foods that does not re need refrigeration. So that's what a condiment is. Ketchup was a condiment 
that originated in uh, Southeast Asia and was basically fermented fish. So it uh, was a fish-based condiment. But the first tomato ketchup uh, was developed uh, in England. And uh, remember, it was called, it was called uh, love apples. So it was a love apple type of ketchup. Um, and it used as a preservative um, brandy. So uh, kind of interesting. And, but the modern ketchup, however you want to spell it, that uses sugar and or vinegar as preservatives were, was developed in the 1860s, 1870s. The two major uh, producers of it was a company called Heinz Company. Um, and then the other one that has subsequently gone out of business was the Hazard Ketchup Company. Uh, and they, the, the advertising was kind of uh, vicious and um, Heinz outcompeted uh, Hazard in part because of claims of hazard ketchup not being pure. So hazard was a hazard. Oh, gosh. And then the last thing uh, about this uh, history of the tomato, as the small local companies coalesced and they bought each other out, there was a need for product consistency from year to year and from one part of the country to the other part of the country. So, the, so these products could be shipped all over and it wouldn't matter, they would always taste the same. And for that, the various companies dealing with tomato products developed their own varieties of tomatoes that they then contracted to farmers to grow so that they would be ripe at a certain time, sent to their plants, processed, and always taste the same and always have the same uh, attributes. And this, the attributes, by the way, were exactly what the flavor saver was, was going to solve. Transport, transportability, a size uniformity, uh, the ability to, to um, uh, hold up in transport, or in storage prior to processing. The flavor saver was amazing because you could literally put it in a truck of these big trucks that were loaded with tomatoes. So you'd have 20 tons of tomatoes. The skin was so tough that it wouldn't crush. It could sit out in the sun for up to a week without going bad before it was processed by the plant. So it was kind of an amazing industrial product. Um, not a vegetable, maybe, or vegetable, industrial vegetable. Okay. Okay, so the plants that we're talking about, that we're giving out this Saturday. We have four tomatoes that I, I think are great. One is an indeterminate one called the Sunset Red Horizon. This is actually a Russian heirloom one. It is an indeterminate plant. Uh, it consistently produces fruit in cool situations, cool weather situations. It's a short term or short season tomato. It will set fruit, I mean, it will have ripe fruit uh, within 50 to 65 days from the time the fruit is set. This is a ox heart variety, so the size and shape will be slightly variable. It is when ripe, uh, bright red. Sorry, I can't, <laughs> I can't do that. Uh, the Moscovich uh, tomato is another one that we, this is a Russian variety. It's slightly flattened tomato, bright red also, uh, produces in 60 days from uh, fruit set. Uh, so um, we're very interested in seeing how this one, this one goes. Early Annie is our third one. This is a determinant variety. So the fruit will ripen uh, very uniformly. Uh, so you'll have uh, three to four inch diameter fruit, uh, very few seeds in this. This is an excellent one for canning and is also um, a cool weather uh, variety. Let's see. Let's see. I'm sorry, guys. 
early Annie. Uh, gold dust is the last one that we're going to be talking about. This is another determinant tomato. It, it produces uh, yellow or yellow pink um, tomatoes. It was developed by the University of New Hampshire in uh, 1992. The fruit, though, can be a uh, fairly good size, half pound or more, uh, as far as the fruit size goes. Nutrition uh, and tomatoes, something interesting I found out about when I had prepared this originally. The, on the left, you see the red tomato. On the right, you see the yellow tomato. If you look at the top part of about the same, yeah, calories, protein, fiber. Uh, but when you get down towards the bottom, when we're talking about uh, sodium, for example, the sodium is significantly lower in, in the red tomatoes than it is the uh, yellow tomato. Uh, vitamin C higher in the red tomato than the uh, yellow tomato. Uh, when you're looking at uh, vitamin D, however, the yellow tomatoes have twice as much vitamin D as the uh, red tomato. When it comes to foliants, uh, again, the yellow tomato is high. Uh, vitamin A, however, and lycopene uh, are non-existent in the yellow tomatoes, but uh, quite high in, in the red, red tomatoes. Okay, we talked about earlier this uh, tomotene, and now they have the lycopene. It's an ex extract of, from um, tomatoes that may or may not have um, uh, health effects in reducing heart diseases and certain cancers. Um, lycopene, it actually increases as you cook your tomatoes. It only occurs in the red tomatoes. So uh, something to consider if you're into lycopene. And uh, recently I've been uh, informed uh, by uh, Melissa, our master gardener, uh, potato lady, that lycopene is, is, is oftentimes used in topical facial treatment, uh, oils and supplements that you use on your face. So there you go. And let's see. Uh, The last section I want to talk about, and I know we're going a little long here, is uh, seed saving. Uh, most people purchase plants for transplanting. We're giving you plants to transplant. But all, this, all the fruit that we're giving you, all the tomatoes that we give you are open pollinated, which means that they're not uh, hybrids. So if you save the seeds and plant them, it will be true to form. But getting seeds from fresh tomatoes is a process. First, you got to squeeze the seeds and juice from your tomatoes into a container. You set the container in a warm, dark, dark location for a number of days while it ferments. Uh, mold will grow on the top of it uh, after two or three days. Um, you may have to add water if it's, it's very warm. Then you, after, after about a week, you decant off the liquids, retaining the seeds. You rinse the seeds multiple times uh, with uh, clean water. The viable mature seeds will sink to the bottom. The immature or damaged seeds will float. Discard those. If you're going to be selling or distributing the seeds, you have to uh, soak it in um, a weak bleach solution for about 30 minutes to kill any surface bacteria that you may have on it. Uh, the last thing you want to do is give some seeds to your neighbor or fellow gardeners and have them report that the, the plants that came up diseased and affected the rest of their garden. So uh, after you've uh, disinfected them, Place it on a clean, dry surface. Don't use a paper towel or a cloth because the seeds will stick. And then when you pull them off, you can damage the seeds. And then let them dry at room temperature for five or six days. And then uh, store them in a Ziploc bag. Uh, and they don't need freezing. Um, let me, okay, I got, I got, oh gosh. I got to tell you, so this process of seed saving replicates 
uh, the seeds going through the digestive tract of an animal so that it goes through and uh, is deposited uh, after it's gone through the digestive tract and then it will sprout there. So another way that you could get your seeds if you really wanted to without going through this is eat the tomato and then go through, you understand. Uh, another interesting fact is that the, the, the tomato seeds uh, are, are an indicator of sewer treatment plant efficiency in the biosolids uh, and digestion of the biosolids. If it's done right, then you'll have few, if any, uh, viable um, tomato seeds uh, and plants sprouting up in the biosolids from a digestion uh, at a sewage plant. Um, kind of interesting. The other, the other interesting thing is that uh, 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 marijuana seeds also have the same propensity to go through the system and sprout. So it, uh, if the plant is operating well, then you have few pot plants and few tomato plants coming out of your biosolids. Um, and then the last one is pinworms. Pinworms eggs, I'm sorry, pinworms eggs also are, go through the system if it's not handled right, which is another contaminant of biosol. So not that you guys cared about that stuff. Okay, um, let's see, we talked about that, we talked about that. Okay, where did we get our plants? Gary Adson and Dag Malaisi, uh, they operate Tomato Fest, which is a farm in the Bay Area, and they grow um, about 300, 650 types of organic, open pollinated heirloom tomatoes. And they, their focus uh, is on seeds and selling to farms to grow for the farm to fork uh, group. Uh, Gary was also the executive director of the uh, Carmel Toma Tomato Fest. Uh, for a number of years also. I can't get this straight. <laughs> there we go. I, there, ah. And then Charles Chambray, the manager, uh, he was the one who uh, grew them and you saw him in the video. And we, we are <clears throat> doing these to look at high elevation uh, food production techniques and he's very interested in that as well. Uh, there are festivals about concerning tomatoes. Los Banos is, I think, still on for October. There's one in New York. There's one in um, Spain. They're all over the world. Some of them have kind of interesting um, events, like the slip and slide that uses tomato sauce. Kind of cool. And then, uh, where are you going to pick up the plants? Same place that you've done the other ones, the Truckee Demonstration Garden, the UC Davis Field Station Garden there, Incline Village at the Demonstration Garden, and then in South Lake Tahoe, we're doing it at the Verde Mexican Restaurant Rotisserie uh, uh, Garden there. Um, and let's see if I have one more slide that I, uh, gosh darn. Questions, here's my email, and to view the presentation later, there you go. So the reason we do these workshops is not only to tell you how to grow or get you encouragement to grow these vegetables, but also give you some stories to talk about when you have friends or family over that, that you grew them, you picked them, but you can also tell them about the Tomo team. You can talk about uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson. You can talk about all kinds of stories about tomatoes to increase the appreciation of this very unusual fruit or vegetable. And I think that's it. Thanks, Anne. Great. So since we've already watched the demo videos, we're going to move straight into the question and answer period. So for those of you uh, sticking around for the question and answer, remember that those will be in the chat. And the first question we have for you, Dave, is what is the best fertilizer for tomatoes? Um, good question, but it's not a simple one to answer. Uh, if you're going to go organic, then you're talking about uh, typically fertilizing compounds that are less than 5% total weight. And so you're looking at uh, compost, well-aged compost, well-aged manure. It's best to use chicken manure or 
uh, Charles likes is fish emulsion compounds. If you're going with not too concerned about being organic, then you can go to any one of the um, commercial fertilizers, look for something 555, 10, 10, 10, just use half as much. Uh, and you want a general purpose fertilizer as opposed to something like um, ammonium sulfate, which is very high in nitrogen, but not very much in, in uh, phosphorus or, or potassium. So it kind of depends. I, that's not a very good answer, but that's for the time we have, I think that's what I'm going to give you. Mm -hmm. The second question is, would mulch serve the same purpose as a plastic covering? Oh, shoot. I should have mentioned, no, don't use mulch. The, when you use mulch around the tomato plant, it does conserve moisture, so that's a benefit. But <clears throat> it definitely cools the soil. So if you mulch around your tomato plants, you will conserve some moisture in the soil, but you will find that the soil temperature is much lower because the mulch is absorbing that heat from the sun and is not transmiss transmitting it through the soil itself. At what temperature at night should we put on the frost cloth? Okay, so for the one for the tomatoes that we are giving you, I would not worry about putting a frost cloth on as long as the, the low nighttime temperature does not go below 40 degrees. So as long as you're above 40 degrees, don't worry about it. <clears throat> If your fruit has already been set, then you don't even have to worry about it until you get down to the mid 30s because the fruit is already set. That setting of the fruit, those few days from the time the flower opens to the time it's pollinated and then the fruit starts forming is the critical temperature that you're looking at in tomatoes. So 40 degrees less when it's setting fruit, 35 degrees or less when, once the fruit are set and they're starting to ripen. Do indeterminate tomatoes perform better in Tahoe? Uh, not necessarily, although there are a lot more uh, types of these tomatoes out there than determinate kind. The nice thing about uh, indeterminate is they set fruit throughout the season. Determinate ones, once they set that fruit, if you have a cold snap and those fruit go away because it's been too cold, you're out of luck because the determinant plant is not going to set a whole bunch of more flowers after that. The indeterminant, however, if those first few flowers or late flowers don't work, then the ones in the middle will produce uh, fruit. So from that standpoint, you will get more consistent production out of the indeterminant but not necessarily more quantity out of the term. What do you mean when you say uh, when the fruit is set? Okay, uh, so uh, a flower will form and it will open and it needs to be pollinated. From the time the, the flower is pollinated until the time that the uh, blossom, the, the petals fall off and the small fruit forms is called fruit set. So we're setting the fruit and once it's set and starts expanding, get bigger, then we're okay. But that that from from pollinization till the time that the fruit is actually formed is what we're talking about when we're talking about fruit set. Is there a particular tomato that does better in raised beds or of any of the four varieties that will be given out? Uh, uh, well, ask us in September <laughs> because one of the things we're doing is finding out how these particular varieties do. The thing in raised beds or containers is because you have less volume of soil that the soil temperatures will fluctuate significantly. For uh, raised beds, however, um, there might be enough volume so it doesn't fluctuate as much and you do have better control over both your irrigation and your soil temperatures. So 
generally, generally, we have found that tomatoes do better in raised beds than direct planting in the ground. But that's not always the case. But in these four tomatoes, we're hoping that you tell me what works best in the raised bed. How often should compost and organic fertilizers be added to tomato plants? Does it vary for determinate versus indeterminate plant? Uh, for our level of uh, gardening, it doesn't matter between uh, determinate and indeterminate. And um, this, is, this is a great question. We could go on for uh, five minutes on it. But, but basically, uh, you want to add your fertilizer once after the plant is established. So you've, you've prepared your soil, you've put for like uh, uh, was said in the video, you, you put the soil into the, or the fertilizer into the soil at the time of planting. You don't want to add any fertilizer while the plant gets established. You might be able to add one small amount of uh, fertilizer um, three weeks, two, three weeks after the plant has been planted. And then you don't want to add fertilizer after that unless you have really crappy soil. And the reason is tomatoes will take the nitrogen up and look fantastic. So you'll have a fantastic green leafy plant, but because the vegetative part is doing so well, it will not set fruit. So what you want to do is not have a bright green plant you want that plant slightly stressed so it will form those tomatoes and it will will set the fruit. So um, like, like we said, prepare the soil with fertilizer three weeks after the plant has been planted, maybe one application of fertilizer and that should be it for the season. Um, if I neglected to pinch off the flowers and I planted my tomato plant a little over a week ago, can I still remove them now? Uh, yes, you can. You can go ahead and, and pinch them off. Um, I would say that that was the case in 99% of the situations. However, if you have a determinant plant, the one that goes um, and sets all the fruit, then uh, you run the risk of having um, n not a second blush of flowers after that. Can you suggest a pot size for container gardening for tomatoes? Uh, minimum pot size, minimum pot size would be about a gallon and a half to two gallons for one plant. What are a few companion plants for tomatoes? Um, <laughs> garlic, radishes, onions. And will we only receive one type of starter tomato at the pickup? Oh, I'm not. I'm not sure. I can't say for for sure. Anne. How many people, we have 500 tomato plants, plus or minus, but we have a lot of people who have signed up. So where are we at on the numbers to answer this question? Yes, so there is some interest as well, though we have a lot of potato plants, or a tomato, not potato. Um, there, we did have to cap the registration because there has been a lot of interest expressed even prior to knowing how many tomato plants we were going to receive. Um, we do have over 500 people registered to pick up tomato plants, so um, it will be contingent upon what the pickup actually looks like on Saturday. If you did not uh, meet the deadline that cut off for the registration to be able to pick up starter plants, I would recommend um, if you know the location of the pickup location near your home, um, which I'm going to show in a second, the different addresses uh, show up at the end of the pickup window. And if there are any tomato plants um, still that haven't been accounted for, um, you're welcome to show up and try to get a tomato plant, but we can't guarantee that people will be able to receive them if they weren't registered for them. Okay, so to clarify, we have 500 tomato plants, about 500 people signed up to pick up plants. So the answer to this is, 
we will start off by giving one type of tomato per person until we see how it goes. And if we seem to be running, have a lot left, then we'll give two or three. That's all I got to say. Huh. Yep, we are definitely, um, it's been a challenge to figure out the accurate numbers and be able to supply this to the community. And we've been very excited by the interest shown in receiving starter plants. Um, and we are using all of the information based on the registration numbers and how many people end up coming out to pick up plants um, to better inform this process for us in the future. Um, but that is all of the information that we can provide for you on that right now. Um, another question that has come in is, are tomatoes self-pollinating? Yes, they, they, they can be self-pollinating. Okay, and the last question that we're gonna end on um, tonight is, if you add water to the solid fertilizer, will it dissolve and can it be added to plants? Uh, it would kind of depend on the solid fertilizer purchase. A lot of the pelletized fertilizer that you get are slow dissolving types. So you would have to leave it in the water for a long time before it would dissolve so that you can just add it that way. Um, the ones that do uh, solubilize quickly typically are, are have on their label that that's the way they would prefer you to, to do it. But most of the solid ones are designed not to be a fast release, but a slow release. Great. Thank you so much, Dave. Just to wrap up quickly here um, on the last information regarding pickup time. Um, at the four different locations, as Dave mentioned, we'll have pickup in, um, oh, not from the beginning of the presentation, in uh, South Lake Taco, Taco, Lake Tahoe at Verde Mexican Restaurant, uh, Mexican Rotisserie, um, and then in Truckee at the Slow Food Lake Tahoe Food Bank Garden. Um, formerly known as the Truckee Demonstration Garden in Incline Village at the Tahoe Science Center, also located where the North Tahoe Demonstration Garden is, and as well in Tahoe City at the um, Tahoe City Demonstration Garden. Um, please note the times. Um, South Lake Tahoe has a unique time of 8.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. pickup window, and the three other locations are picking up from um, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And those pickups are this Saturday, June 6th. Uh, as a reminder, to be able to pick up your starter plants, we ask that you fill out this survey prior to coming to pick up your tomatoes. That's helping us collect data on, um, as Dave was saying, how these species uh, are performing in the Tahoe Basin. And we'll be following up with you later in the season with an additional survey uh, inquiring about how those certain plants performed. We ask that you wear a mask. And again, we've been very excited about the donations coming in um, and have a five to $10 suggested donation with these pickups. Um, but if you have any additional questions for Dave, um, or if you want to rewatch this workshop, like I said earlier, if you wanna go back to any of those planting demo videos, they are in higher resolution in the version that is uploaded onto the uh, UC Davis Turk website at that link. And there is the survey link again. So. Take time, fill it out, and we are excited to see everyone on Saturday to pick up the four different varieties of tomatoes. Um, and hopefully we'll have a better idea once we pick up the tomatoes, how we will be able to distribute those. So thank you all so much for joining us later um, this evening. Um, and we're excited to get everyone out in the garden and being able to grow some lovely tomatoes. So thanks again, Dave, for all of your fun history facts. And uh, we're excited to see how everyone is doing with their gardens when we follow up on June 16th. And there'll be more information coming out about that. Everyone have a great night.